Yeah. We're rolling. Okay. Uh, good evening. Welcome. Thank you for uh, for turning out tonight. It is uh, my uh, my name is Alan Cohen, and it is uh, my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, to you Peter Walner. Peter is the director of the library at the uh, New Hampshire Historical Society up in uh, up in Concord, and that's where I met him about a year ago. I'm a volunteer there a couple of days a week, and uh, Peter's got a very uh, very interesting. Uh, background, perhaps he'll tell you more about it if, if uh, prompted. He's got a, a PhD from uh, Penn State in history. He taught and was an administrator for uh, 30 years in uh, secondary schools in Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Wisconsin, but always had uh, a burning desire to do some work on, on Pierce. He doesn't come from New Hampshire, but uh, in 2002, he relocated himself uh, to New Hampshire and started doing research up in uh, Concord at the Historical Society, which has the largest collection of, uh, of Pierce papers anywhere in the United States. He finished his, uh, his first book in uh, 2004, uh, Pierce, New Hampshire's native son, I guess. And, uh, both favorite son. Favorite son. And uh, finished his, uh, his second book uh, in 2007, A Martyr for the Union. And uh, his books in hardcover and uh, paperback are available tonight if you uh, twist his arm and put some, some cash in his hand. You don't have too much twisting. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, Peter, uh, like a, a lot of real bright people, has lots of interests, and I have the great pleasure of uh, having lunch with him a couple of days a week up in uh, Concord where we talk about all kinds of things, including uh, sports, and he's got an encyclopedic uh, uh, memory about, about things like that. So anyway, uh, please be, uh, look forward to be, to be inspired by a legitimate subject matter expert on Franklin Pierce, Peter Wong. Thank you, Alan. It's nice to be introduced by someone who actually knows me a little bit. <laughs> uh, my topic, the title of my talk tonight is Franklin Pierce, one of our worst presidents with a question mark. And the subtitle might be, all you ever want to know about Franklin Pierce's presidency, uh, over afraid to ask. Uh, you're going to hear more probably than you want to know about it tonight. But I think what's interesting is to think about the presidency, the issues that he had to deal with, and kind of think in context of today's issues and see if you see any connections or, or even how different things were in the time Pierce was president. Nevertheless, one of the reasons I'll mention my longtime interest in Franklin Pierce, uh, when I was in graduate school, my mentor, uh, had written a biography of James Buchanan in Pennsylvania. And he told me that there had not been a good biography of Franklin Pierce. Well, I went into teaching and, you know, in the back of my mind, I figured somebody's going to write a biography of Pierce one of these days. Well, 30 years later, I, there still wasn't a biography of Franklin Pierce. So when I got to a point in my career where I really needed a break from being a headmaster of a private school, I decided to take a year off and come up here and just start and see what I could do. I'd never written anything. I hadn't published anything in my life, except for writing memos to my teachers. That's about the, the extent of my writing. Uh, but once I got started, I couldn't put it down. I couldn't quit. I couldn't finish it. I, I couldn't uh, go back to teaching, and I just had to finish the job. And five years later, uh, I'd written two volumes on Franklin Pierce, and the Historical Society gave me a full-time job. So, so I ended up tra changing careers and becoming a, a New Hampshire resident, very happily so, too. Um, I'm convinced that, that Franklin Pierce is one of our least known presidents. People just don't know very much about him. Even in New Hampshire, where he's the only president from the Granite State, very few people know very much about him. <clears throat> they have a sense <clears throat> that he wasn't a very good president, but if you ask them why, what he did that was so bad, most people wouldn't know. Uh, so tonight I'm going to tell you all about his presidency. I'm going to focus mostly on the presidency rather than other parts of his life, but certainly if you have any questions about his family life or his marriage or his earlier career, uh, you can certainly ask them at the end, and I'll, I'll do the best I can to answer them. And I can tell you that my two volumes give you a complete history of all of his life, uh, especially his early life, which I think was quite interesting, actually, and was completely unknown to me when I came up here. But to, to convince you that you don't know very much about Franklin Pierce, uh, let me ask, give you a couple of facts about him that very rarely uh, do people know, but that I think are interesting. First of all, one fact about Pierce's presidency, that Pierce is one of only two presidents who made his political career in a small state, who reached the presidency after a political career in a small state. Does anybody know who the other president was? Who Coolidge. Came? 
Coolidge. came to no because Coolidge was his his, uh, his he was born in Vermont, but his political career was in Massachusetts. Was Jimmy Carter? No, not Carter. Georgia was well. Georgia Arthur? was close, but it wasn't really a small state. But you're getting warmer as far as who that Hutton? president was. Hutton. Yes, Hutton from Arkansas. Oh, that's why not. <laughs> and interestingly enough, uh, my first volume was uh, published on the same day that Clinton's autobiography was published. And the Los Angeles Times somehow picked that out <clears throat> and did an article about the two books, claiming that you know my book had 2,000 published, then Clinton's had 2 million. And they <laughs> co compared the two. And they wrote articles in the Los Angeles Times, which was great publicity for my book. Thank you. Yes, sir. And, uh, and that was picked up by the Washington Post, which is associated with the Times. And then eventually, about a year later, uh, Clinton came to the borders uh, in, or Barnes & Noble in uh, Manchester to sign books, and I was invited to be one of the special guests who would meet him, and we would exchange books. And so I handed him a copy of my book, and he said, oh, I know this book. Uh, Brian Williams recommended it to me, the uh, NBC newsman, so I was thrilled. Uh, and I, I said, that, but I had to tell him, I said, thank you, he gave me a copy of his book signed. But I had to tell him, I said, you know, I've read your book already, and I have to tell you that you refer to yourself and Pierce as the only two small state governors to ever be elected president. And I said, I have to correct you, Pierce was never the governor of New Hampshire. <laughs> well, for some reason, Bill Clinton has never spoken to me since. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, Pierce and Clinton are the only two small state politicians to ever reach the presidency. And it was almost as hard in 1852 to get to be president from New Hampshire as it would be today. Another fact about Franklin Pierce is presidency. He's the only president in our history from George Washington to the present, present to have the same cabinet for the full four years of his administration. There were no changes in Pierce's cabinet. There were only seven cabinet members in those days. There were four under Washington. There are 28 or something today. But nevertheless, no other president in our history has gone through a full four-year term with the same people in this cabinet. And there were no resignations, nobody forced out because of any scandal, <laughs> nobody quitting because of, you know, a difference in policy. It's also interesting to me that it Pierce's seven cabinet members, not one of them ever said a bad word about him, even after uh, the Civil War and so forth. They all praised his uh, years as president. So that sounds fairly positive, but on the negative side, Pierce is also the only president, you know, the only elected president who served a full four-year term in office who was denied renomination by his own party. So he was denied the opportunity to even run for a second term. No other president had ever been elected and denied that, that opportunity. Others like Phil Warren, Tyler, and so forth became president by accident and were passed over for a chance to run on their own. But no other president has ever been renominated, has not failed to be renominated after being elected president. And one other minor point that I found out <coughs> only in recent uh, months Pierce was also the, the first president in our history to actually sail away from our shores while he was in office. It was a small trip. He went from Portsmouth, New Hampshire to uh, Norfolk, Virginia after visiting New Hampshire during the last months of his administration. And he was picked up by a naval ship in Portsmouth and taken to <coughs> Norfolk. It was out, you know, a couple hundred miles away from our territorial waters. It's the only time, first time in our history, the president ever left our shores while in office. Uh, and so it's just a minor point, but it was something that his, the captain of the ship was quite excited about and wrote at great length about it in his own autobiography. Well, before Pierce became president, he had a 25-year career in, in public life, something that's also not generally known. Pierce's father was a Revolutionary War hero from, from Hillsborough, Benjamin Pierce. He was very active in politics, served for 13 years in the State Assembly, was a, a term, uh, served a term as sheriff of Hillsborough County, served a four-year term as a member of the uh, uh, Governor's Council, and was twice elected governor of the state while he was in his 70s. Uh, so Benjamin Pierce was a very well-known, very active and uh, respected politician and uh, leader in New Hampshire in his own right. His son, Franklin Pierce, was the fourth of five sons. He was the only one of the five to go to college and to graduate from college. Pierce graduated from Bowdoin College, where his best friends were uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne, the future writer, and uh, John Parker Hale, future abolitionist senator from New Hampshire. Pierce returned to New Hampshire and uh, was, got, became a lawyer right away, 
got involved in politics right away. He was elected moderator of the Hillsdale uh, uh, town meeting at 22. He was elected to the state legislature at 23. He was elected by the members of the state assembly to be their speaker at age 25, the youngest man in our history to, up till today to be elected uh, speaker of the state assembly in New Hampshire. At 27, he was elected to the United States Congress, and at age 31, he was chosen by the state uh, legislature to be a U.S. Senator from New Hampshire. So you can see he had a meteoric rise to prominence in politics, and whether you think he was a good president or not, that certainly indicates that he was well respected by the people of New Hampshire at this very early uh, time, which is why I titled my uh, first volume New Hampshire's Favorite Son, because he clearly was the favorite son of New Hampshire uh, uh, voters. Then he did something also very unusual in politics. He resigned from the Senate at age 37 to return to New Hampshire. He had a wife and two young children at the time. He hadn't had a chance to make a lot of money as a lawyer because he had gotten into politics so early. So he returned to New Hampshire to uh, take care of his family, basically, and to make his career. But he really also returned to uh, heal the wounds within the Democratic Party. And he took over the leadership of the state Democratic Party and was really the boss of the Democratic Party for the next 10 years, very much like a late 19th century ward boss in, in Chicago or, or New York City. Pierce dominated the Democratic Party for those 10 years and ran the party with an iron fist. But he never ran for office himself during that time. He was offered a job in the Polk administration as attorney general, but he turned it down. He was offered a chance to return to the Senate. He turned it down. He was offered a chance to run for governor and he turned it down. But that didn't mean he wasn't known by everybody in the state as the leader of his party. The only time he left Concord, or left New Hampshire, during those 10 years was to serve in the Mexican War at 42. Pierce gave it all up and signed on uh, to fight in the Mexican War. Uh, this was part of his background, his upbringing. His father had been in the Revolutionary War. His two older brothers had been in, this, <coughs> in 1812. His brother-in-law was a general in the uh, US Army. And Pierce had a great desire to serve in the military at some point in his life. And the Mexican War was his only chance. And even though he was 42 and a lawyer and had a young family, he uh, signed up and was appointed by Polk as a brigadier general. He was very much a political general, sort of like Theodore Roosevelt would be in the Spanish-American War. He had no military experience at all, but he was made a brigadier general. He organized his brigade, sailed off from Rhode Island to uh, Veracruz in Mexico, marched them 250 miles overland to Mexico City, where he joined up with Winfield Scott's army and fought in all the battles around Mexico City. Uh, although the volunteer troops did not have, not have a very good reputation during the Civil War, Pierce's brigade was considered the best of the group of the volunteer army uh, during that time. So, um, may, uh, one of the things that's interesting about Franklin Pierce I mentioned before that he was considered the boss of the Democratic Party. This cartoon came out in 1850 during the gubernatorial campaign. Uh, Pierce had to dump the candidate for governor of the Democrats, a Reverend Abbott, and they had to dump him from the ticket because Abbott said something that was out of the Democratic Party's platform. And the, the cartoon shows Pierce, this is Pierce up here, dictating to poor Abbott, who's saying, please spare me, General, I'll say whatever you want. <laughs> um, and uh, Pierce basically said, no way, no, you're out. And that, sh that shows how powerful Pierce was, how much the opposition recognized that every candidate who ran for office uh, was really Pierce's puppet, so to speak, or at least they thought so. And those uh, politicians and lawyers who worked with Pierce were known as the Concord Clique. Well, the Concord Clique turned out to be a fairly uh, useful group, because two years later, in 1852, although Pierce had not held office for 10 years, he was nominated by the Democratic Party to be their candidate for president. The reason that happened was a combination of things. First, the Mexican War officers who had served with Pierce from all over the country uh, chose him as the person they wanted to run for president. That included General Cushing uh, from uh, Massachusetts, and I'm afraid his name was General from Tennessee, uh, Pillow from Tennessee who was a good friend of James K. Polk's. They were leading general, leading Democrats, and they were returned from the Mexican War, and they wanted, they pushed Pierce as their candidate for president. And the Concord clique, those uh, politicians loyal to Pierce from New Hampshire, also went to the convention in Baltimore with the idea that they were going to nominate Pierce for president, 
even though there were 12 other announced candidates and Pierce was not an announced candidate. Nobody knew that Pierce was running, except Pierce did uh, quietly, and the Mexican War generals did, and the contract click did. And when the convention deadlocked over the other candidates, uh, they suddenly uh, got the Virginia delegation to nominate Pierce, and within a couple of ballots, he swept uh, the convention. So you can imagine how unknown he was to the general public, however, 10 years out of office from New Hampshire. Uh, yet they knew he was loyal, they knew he was a, a loyal Democrat, they knew he'd had a brilliant uh, career up to this point. There's Pierce and his uh, running mate, Senator William Rufus Devane King of Alabama. Uh, Pierce has another unusual feature in that King died within a month after the Pierce administration uh, was inaugurated. And so, and for the next uh, four years, there was no vice president. There was no provision at that time for replacing a vice president. So Pierce served for the next uh, four years without a vice president. He never was going to, he wasn't going to, King was really not going to be an important part of his administration anyway, because from the time they were nominated in June of 1852 until uh, King died in April of 1853, the two men had not had any correspondence or had never talked or communicated with each other. <laughs> King was not Pierce's choice, and he had no interest in, in, uh, in his being involved with his administration. <laughs> Interestingly enough, Pierce's opponent, imagine this guy on a poster. <laughs> his opponent in the election of 1852 was General Winfield Scott, Pierce's uh, commanding general in the Mexican War. Uh, Scott was typical of the Whigs. They had won with uh, uh, Harrison in 40, they had won with Tyler in 48 or Taylor and 48 uh, military heroes, so they felt they would nominate another military hero in 52. Uh, but uh, Scott was a very vain and pompous man. He was very grouchy and not, not a good politician, and not particularly popular. He wasn't even popular with his, uh, with his officers, people mostly support his peers. <laughs> so uh, Pierce swept the election, winning 27 out of 31 states, you know, with a margin of over 500,000 over uh, Scott, which was a fairly large amount considering there were only about 6 million votes, I believe, cast at the time. <coughs> this is uh, Pierce's son and wife, uh, Jane Pierce, uh, had married Franklin Pierce in 1834. Uh, she was uh, not fond of politics. She was a very uh, somewhat sickly woman, uh, somewhat depressed. Uh, she was very uh, just the opposite in personality. Pierce was very gregarious, he was outgoing, he knew everybody, he loved being around people. His wife was very quiet, very reserved, very attached to her family. Uh, it's hard to imagine two people who are so different getting together, yet they, they seem to have, a, by all accounts, and by all that I could figure out, they seem to have a very uh, good, loving relationship, even though they were so different. Uh, this was their only surviving son, Benny, who was 11 years old when Pierce was elected president. Uh, they had two other children who had both died at an early age. Uh, their oldest son, uh, first son, died within three days after birth, and their other child, Frankie, died at four and a half of typhus. Uh, and so they had Benny. Unfortunately they, for Pierce, the excitement and pride that he felt in being elected president was quickly dashed because on January 6, 1853, uh, two months before Pierce was to become president, Benny was killed in a train accident with his with Frank and Jane in the car with him. The car tumbled down the embankment in Andover, North Andover, Massachusetts, and Benny's head was crushed right in front of their eyes. So mm -hmm. at age, uh, so before becoming president, Pierce had to suffer with the loss of his last child in such a tragic uh, way. And it certainly affected Jane, who was always depressed, as one of her relatives said, for someone who was always so depressed anyway, now she has such a good reason to be depressed, they could doubt that she would ever pull out of it. Um, and as a result, uh, this is the lithograph that appeared in the newspapers at the time showing the accident. The car is down here at the bottom of the ravine. It was a wooden car with a canvas top, believe it or not. It's hard to picture it today, but it just crumbled into nothing uh, when it fell off the uh, embankment. So Pierce leaves for Washington uh, in this uh, state of mourning. So this is a, a lithograph of uh, downtown Concord. It looks very much like it does today. <laughs> Pierce spent the last night. Uh, Pierce spent the last night before leaving for Washington at the Eagle Hotel on the left, and there was a crowd there to see him off as he headed uh, for Washington. 
without Jane, who was stuck in mourning and refused to attend the inauguration. And she didn't move into the White House until a couple of weeks after uh, Pierce was inaugurated. This is the oldest <laughs> surviving photograph of the White House, showing what it looks like around the time that Pierce was inaugurated. Of course, he was inaugurated at the Capitol on uh, March 4th, 1853. The inaugural ball was canceled because of the mourning for uh, their son, Benny. As I said, Jane wasn't there. Nevertheless, there were about 30,000 people who showed up in Washington uh, to celebrate the uh, inauguration of Pierce. And he stunned the crowd by giving a 30-minute inaugural address entirely from memory, with no notes. No other president in our history has ever done that. He stood up in front of the crowd, took his coat off like a, like a country preacher, and, uh, and mm -hmm. stood out in front of the crowd and spoke for 30 minutes uh, without any notes. Of course, one of the first things the president has to do is to choose his cabinet. And this was a really big job at that time, important job at that time, because especially in those days, it was the way to reward your supporters to uh, tell the rest of the country what direction you were going to take as president. And Pierce chose, by all accounts, a very able cabinet. The leaders of the cabinet, of course, the Secretary of State up in the upper left was uh, William Marcy, who had been a senator and governor of New York. Um, Marcy had not had a lot of foreign policy experience, but he turned out to be a, a very able uh, Secretary of State. On the upper right is James Guthrie from Kentucky, who was the Secretary of the Treasury. And most people give Guthrie as one of the top Secretaries of the Treasury in our history. During Pierce's administration, the national debt was paid down by 60%. Imagine doing that today. They had a surplus budget. They had a surplus in the budget every year that Pierce was president, and they used the surplus to pay down the national debt. Uh, in the middle, uh, this man here is uh, Caleb Cushing from uh, uh, Massachusetts, one of the uh, Mexican War generals who supported Pierce. Uh, one, considered one of the most uh, brilliant men of his time, uh, Cushing really created the modern Justice Department. Uh, when uh, Pierce was elected president, the Attorney General's job was basically just to advised the president on legal matters. He had no administration, no department working under him. But by an executive order, Pierce signed an executive order which moved all of the U.S. Marshal Service, all of the uh, lower courts uh, under the, uh, from the Secretary of State's office to the Attorney General's office. Up until that time, the Secretary of State was in, in charge of all of the judicial matters and the law enforcement of the United States as well as foreign affairs. So in one stroke of the pen, Pierce uh, gave Cushing a whole administration, a whole department to operate, and Cushing then sat down and wrote a, a manual of what the duties of the Attorney General should be, which is still the manual today that Attorney Generals use for determining their duties. The most famous man in Pierce's cabinet is this man, hmm. Jefferson Davis. Yeah. And we all know Jefferson Davis as the future president <coughs> of the Confederacy. Jefferson Davis was the Secretary of War under Pierce. That's the same as Secretary of Defense today. Uh, most people who look at the Pierce administration and see Jefferson Davis in it assumes that that meant it was a pro-Southern cabinet and that Jefferson Davis was working you know, against the country on behalf of the South. That really wasn't the case. He was a very able Secretary of War. While Jefferson Davis was uh, Secretary of War under Pierce, the Army was, uh, grew, was expanded in size. Uh, the pay was increased for, uh, for soldiers and officers. Uh, <coughs> new, new weapons were brought into use. Uh, uh, new armories were built around the country. A new manual of arms was uh, written. And uh, new strategies were written because uh, Davis sent several officers, including young George McClellan, over to Europe to observe the Crimean War and to meet with all the leaders of the different armies over there to come back with whatever new uh, weapons and ideas they could come up with. Uh, they all wrote extensive reports. And probably the most important thing that Davis did was he had five transcontinental railroad routes uh, surveyed. Uh, all five of them later became transcontinental railroad routes. They were used exactly as they were laid out by the surveyors under Davis. Um, and this was, of course, very important uh, in later years to have these five transcontinental railroad routes all uh, uh, set up. Of course, every president has his own goals as to what he wanted to accomplish, and Pierce did too. He came into office with a couple of ideas. One, we already mentioned with regard to Davis, was to modernize the military. Pierce had learned a lot in his brief stint in the Mexican War. He became a great admirer 
of what he called scientific soldiering. The, uh, the training that the uh, officers had gotten at Annapolis or at, at West Point, it really impressed Pierce. He wanted the United States to move from having this reliance on volunteer militias in case of emergency and having a, a, a stronger military, both Army and Navy. And, by, and of course, we mentioned the things that Davis did under Pierce's leadership to improve the Army. The Navy was even more uh, remarkably changed under Pierce. Uh, they, they converted from sail to steam, basically, under Pierce. He had the uh, Congress pass a bill to, create, uh, to, to build six new steam frigates, the largest ships in the world at the time, and later six new steam sloops of war, which were more maneuverable ships, which turned out to be very useful during the Civil War in, in blockading the South, because they could sail in and out of the ports like uh, New Orleans and Mobile and so forth. Uh, and uh, uh, Al-Fatir Mahan, who later wrote a famous history of the uh, U.S. Navy, said that there was no way to calculate how important these improvements were uh, that Pierce had made. Even though the ships were wooden ships, they were still steam ships. They would be later, of course, replaced with, uh, with steel ships. But uh, at the time, these were the most advanced ships in the world, and they were steam, steam ships, which was a, a big improvement. Another of Pierce's goals as president was to improve American trade. He had a very strong desire to lower the tariff to improve America's trade, and, and he actually uh, accomplished this in several ways. First was to uh, set up a, the first reciprocity treaty between the United States, Canada, and Great Britain. The idea was that the goods between Canada and the United States would move back and forth without tariffs, and this increased trade greatly between the United States and Canada. This was a personal goal of Pierce's. He uh, helped uh, uh, push the negotiations to their conclusion, uh, even though there was no, again, there was no support from this for the South, for example, uh, but Pierce got it through and got it passed. He also uh, had at the end of his administration the lowest tariff passed during the uh, 19th century. The closest the United States came to free trade during the 19th century was under uh, Franklin Pierce. So those were some of his goals uh, as president. Uh, here's Jane in mourning. Uh, life in the White House, uh, most historians or most websites that you look at about Franklin Pierce talk about how morose Jane was and what a horrible time the Pierce has had in the White House. That was also much exaggerated. Uh, while she did uh, uh, stay in mourning for two full years, which was the norm at the time, uh, what that meant was that she didn't attend public events. So she didn't attend when the White House, when the White House was open to the public, for example. But that didn't mean that she was uh, the shadow in the White House that some people claim. And the reality was that uh, Pierce had from four to eight people over for dinner every single night in the White House while he was there. Anybody visiting any in Washington was invited to dinner. All congressmen, senators, and their wives were invited at least once during every uh, uh, congressional session. And any visitors, Jane had relatives coming down. Uh, she had between four to eight guests every night for dinner, and she showed up for every one of these dinners, uh, even though she wasn't the most out, outgoing host. Uh, she did her, her duty uh, while Pierce was present. She was assisted in this by her good friend, Abby Means. Abby Means was born in Newport. She had grown up with Jane. They were the same age, but uh, Abby Means was Jane's aunt by marriage because she had married Jane's uncle, uh, his second marriage after his wife died. So this was, uh, she served sort of as social secretary, if you will, during the first uh, two or three years of Jane's uh, of their time in the White House. And she was a very outgoing woman, very popular. Now we get to the reasons why the Pierce administration is considered such a failure. And there are three reasons. One big reason and two somewhat smaller reasons. The big reason was uh, the Kansas-Nebraska bill. And that was the idea of this man, uh, Stephen A. Douglas, senator from Illinois, famous for the Lincoln-Douglas debates. Douglas was probably the most powerful Democrat in Congress, uh, certainly uh, a very dynamic younger man who had aspirations to be president. He uh, proposed the Kansas-Nebraska bill, which would have created the territories of Kansas and Nebraska. If you think about what the country was like when Pierce became president, you'll understand why this was needed. California had come into the Union as a free state in 19, 1850. Nevada was close to coming into the Union, so was Oregon. Uh, but, and Utah was being settled, of course, by the Mormons. But between Utah and the Missouri River, there was a thousand miles of empty space that was not settled by white people. 
It was owned by the Indians. And in order to connect these two floating sections of the country together, there was a need to fill in the space in between, between the Missouri River and the Rocky Mountains. There was no white settlement uh, north of Texas uh, at that time. So, the, uh, and of course the United States had been moving west and there was a great uh, desire to move west into free territory. But in order to allow settlers to move into this territory, you had to, Congress had to pass a law to create the territory, to purchase or uh, make treaties with the Indian, to acquire the land from the Indians, to survey it, to set it up for, for settlement, and to sell the land and uh, establish the communities and so forth. This required congressional legislation. This is how territories were established. And it was normal for Congress to do this, but of course by the 1850s the issue of slavery was so, uh, so divisive that it was very difficult to get a bill passed through Congress, which sounds similar to today, how divided our Senate to Congress is today. Um, so Douglas's bill called for a compromise. In order to get support from the South, uh, the two territories were Kansas and Nebraska. They're much bigger than the states of Kansas and Nebraska today. Kansas went all the way from the Missouri River to the Rocky Mountains, which would have been Kansas and Colorado today. Uh, Nebraska went all the way into to Canada, which would have been North and South Dakota, as well as Nebraska today. So you can see there were large, large territories. Uh, Kansas was bordered on the east by a slave state, Missouri, and the settlers of Missouri wanted to move into Kansas, and they saw no reason why they shouldn't be allowed to move into Kansas with their slaves. Those, of course, north of Kansas were bordered by Iowa, which was free territory, so there was no question that that territory would be free. However, the Missouri Compromise, passed in 1820 by Congress, had ruled slavery out of the territory north of 36 degree 30 minute line, which would have been south of the Kansas border. So in order to uh, get uh, votes from the south to pass the Kansas-Nebraska bill, they had to somehow uh, compromise on this issue. The south was totally united against the bill. There was no reason for them to vote for it if, they couldn't, if, their, set, if their citizens couldn't settle there. Uh, so what, what Douglas proposed was that the Missouri Compromise be repealed and popular sovereignty be put in. Popular sovereignty was the idea that the settlers of the territory would decide for themselves whether they wanted slavery. This seemed very democratic. It was part of the Democratic Party platform of 1852 that Pierce had run on, that popular sovereignty was the way to solve the territorial sectional problems between the North and the South. Pierce was reluctant to approve the bill, but he did eventually support it. And it did pass a very close vote, partly as a result of this man, Alexander H. Stevens of Georgia, who figured out the parliamentary way to get the bill voted on by the House. The Senate approved it right away. Just the opposite of today, where the Senate seems to be the bottleneck. In those days, it was the House. And uh, the Senate passed it overwhelmingly early on, but took a couple of months for it to even come up for a vote in the House. And the House of Opposition from the North did everything they could to keep it from coming up for a vote. And Stevens managed to figure out a way to get it uh, wrote up to a vote by tricking the North, Northern congressmen. And uh, basically, uh, I, it's too complicated to go into, but it was a parliamentary maneuver. They came up for a vote and passed by just 13 votes. But the bill was seen as a uh, repeal of the Missouri Compromise line. It was, it was viewed as a, a, a traitor to the south, to the north. Northern uh, opposition to the bill was severe, uh, and Pierce lost a tremendous amount of support uh, as a result of it. In fact, there were about 40-some northern Democratic congressmen who voted for the bill because it was a party bill and they were expected to vote for it, but who knew that by voting for it they were sacrificing their election in the next election and they didn't lose, they, they were wiped, wiped out. I think it was like, the thing today of uh, the difference, they were talking maybe 20, 30 seats changing hands in a normal uh, election. I think there were 70 some Democrats who lost their seats as a result of that bill in the fall elections of 1854. So that's the main reason why the Pierce administration was considered a failure, partly because popular sovereignty just didn't work. You know, the idea, of voting is that when people vote, the losing side gives in and the winning side gets to, to uh, do, do what they voted for. That wasn't the way with slavery. You know, the losers weren't going to accept the, the, the uh, decision. 
and in, the, in uh, Kansas, the South had a number of votes, uh, and the North refused to accept it. The South also cheated on the election by bringing people in from Missouri to vote who had no intention of staying there. So there was a lot of fraud, there was a lot of violence. Uh, uh, weapons were being shipped in by Northern abolitionists. John Brown uh, slaughtered five uh, pro-slavery uh, settlers uh, in the middle of the night, <coughs> raided their homes and dragged them out of their homes, shot them to death or hacked them to death. They were actually killed with swords, most of them, right in front of their families. Um, and he was considered a hero in the North. And of course went on then to uh, do his raid on Harper's Ferry a few years later. So anyway, that was why the Pierce administration, the main reason why the Pierce administration is so uh, uh, denigrated in history today. The second reason deals with Cuba. Cuba was a colony of Spain at the time. Uh, it was, a, it was a, uh, basically a large sugar plantation that had slaves. The uh, natives, or the, the Creoles on Cuba, on Cuba, wanted to free themselves from Spain. They didn't like Spanish rule, which was very oppressive. And they wanted to become part of the United States. And the southern, uh, the southern uh, congressmen and senators wanted to take Cuba as a uh, colony of the United States because they saw it as a future slave state, since slavery was a part of uh, Cuba. The Democratic Party platform of 1852, just as they approved the westward expansion and opening up in Kansas, Nebraska, also said that we should try to take Cuba as well. Uh, and that was part of the platform that Pierce ran on. Well, Pierce was willing to buy Cuba if we could get it peacefully, but he wasn't willing to go to any great lengths to get it. So after he became president, he told our ambassadors in Europe, after our ambassadors were settled, and here they are, James Buchanan, who would succeed Pierce as president, was our ambassador to Great Britain. His aide was the notorious Dan Sickles, who would be later a famous Civil War general who lost his leg at Gettysburg, thoroughly corrupt man, but Buchanan chose him to be his aide in, uh, in London. Uh, this man, Pierre Soulet, former senator from Louisiana, was our new ambassador to Spain. And this man, John Y. Mason of uh, Virginia, who had been Secretary of the Navy under Polk, was our ambassador to Paris. After these men had gotten over to Europe and were settled in their new posts, Pierce sent them a, a letter from the Secretary of State saying, I'd like you guys to get together somewhere in Europe and meet and try to figure out how we could purchase Cuba from Spain. You know, what would we need to do? What would the Spanish want for it? How would we get around the opposition that the British and the French would have towards us taking this important colony? And so the uh, four men met at a place called Ostend in Belgium, and they wrote a report. Basically, they couldn't come up with a way to get Spain to, uh, to sell to the United States. But they were required to write a report, so they sent Pierce this lengthy report in which they spent three or four or five pages giving all the reasons why Cuba was important to the United States. But then they concluded, we don't think Spain's going to sell it to us. We don't think the British and the French are going to let us buy it from them. So therefore, we should take it by force. Well, this was sent to Franklin Pierce. It was simply a report from his ambassadors. It wasn't his policy. His uh, cabinet got together. They reviewed the Ostend. Uh, manifesto, as it became called. It wasn't a manifesto, it was simply a memo, memo, if you will, from our ambassadors. And they rejected it outright. They said there's no way. And Pierce actually wrote a letter to Soule in Spain saying, you can't be serious. You know, the Spanish have done nothing to us to, rec to justify our uh, attacking Cuba. Uh, and basically, if you can't figure out a way of buying it, then let's just drop the whole matter. If the Spanish won't consider selling it, then let's drop it. Well, as often happens, the uh, memo from the four ambassadors ended up in the hands of the New York Herald, which published it as the policy of the Pierce administration, that the Pierce administration was going to take Cuba by force. It was never our, the policy of the Pierce administration. It was rejected outright. In fact, Pierce fired Soule, the ambassador to Spain, right away. Uh, and uh, it was never the policy of the Pierce administration, but you'll still read it in the textbooks today that the Ostend Manifesto showed that Pierce was supporting the acquisition of Cuba as a slave state to placate the South. Another reason why the Pierce administration was unpopular at the time uh, involved this woman. This is Dorothea Dix, famous reformer. Uh, for 20 years, up until the time Pierce became president, Dorothea Dix had been 
crusading around the country for the improvement of care for the insane. She had tried to get each state to set up a, a, an insane asylum for the poor who were insane. In other words, those who couldn't afford anything else would be able to uh, have the state institution. And she had managed to establish several, but she kept running into the roadblock that the states didn't have enough money and they, they wouldn't, wouldn't support it. So finally she got the idea, well, maybe the federal government can fund it somehow. So she got a friendly congressman and senator to propose a bill where the federal government would set aside 10 million acres of government land, which was the main asset that the government had for raising money at that time. The proceeds from the sale of this $10 million would be designated to the states for the use of uh, setting up insane asylums by, based on the size of the state. So based on the number of electoral votes you get, you get a certain percentage of this 10 million acres of land once it had been sold. Well, this sounds like a good idea at the time. It passed both houses of Congress and went to Pierce's uh, desk for his signature. And he vetoed the bill. And he vetoed it with a very lengthy uh, veto message uh, in which he said, you know, up until now, the states have been responsible for the poor in their areas. And if, if, the, state, if the federal government is responsible for the poor who are insane, then we're responsible for all the poor in all the states. You know, we can't say that we're going to support insane poor and not support the rest of the poor. And uh, he said, that's not, been, that's not my reading of the Constitution, that this is the responsibility of the states. The federal government has never taken on the responsibility for the direct aid to people who were, who were poor or in need. And so he vetoed the bill. And in reality, Dorothy and Dick should have seen it coming because when it passed both houses of Congress, there were many, many senators who had congressmen who abstained. And they abstained because they didn't know whether it was constitutional or not. And they were waiting for leadership from the president to tell them whether or not this was constitutional. So once it uh, appears made his veto message, there was no chance it was going to be overridden by the House and the Senate. They voted uh, overwhelmingly uh, in Pierce's uh, behalf. But Dorothy Dix was a popular woman, and she was very upset by this, and she said some nasty things about Franklin Pierce. She met with Pierce twice in the White House before the bill was signed. He tried to treat her very graciously, but he, he said to her, you know, I do have constitutional concerns about this. I just don't know if I can support this. She didn't quite get it, and uh, she fled to Europe and stayed over there until the Civil War started when she came back and uh, helped them get the nursing corps going. So this obviously didn't help Pierce's... Uh, public relations any. One thing about Franklin Pierce is he was incorruptible. He was a man of principle. And throughout his four years in office, this man was a thorn in his side. This is Richard W. Thompson, who had been a Whig congressman from Indiana. Uh, Thompson uh, had served under President Fillmore as an Indian agent to the Menominee Indians in Michigan and Wisconsin. And what Thompson had done just before uh, Fillmore left office and Pierce took office, was he had negotiated a treaty for the government with the Menominee Indians in which they would sell some of their land to the federal government for $300,000. But included in the treaty was the provision that Thompson would get 100000 of that for himself. <laughs> uh, that today would be the equivalent of about five or six million dollars, which would go to this guy just for his services as the negotiator of the treaty. <coughs> the Indians were all illiterate and didn't know that that's what was in the treaty. They couldn't read the treaty. So they trusted Thompson. He was their Indian agent. It was also against the law, by the way, for the Indian agent to negotiate a treaty, but Thompson didn't care. Anyway, the bill had to be approved by the Senate, as all treaties do, and the Pierce administration immediately rejected it and said, this is crazy, this is not uh, fair, and it's not right. But Thompson had a lot of friends in, in the Senate, and the bill kept coming up year after year for the full four years that Pierce is in office. They had to deal with this, because Thompson kept bringing it up. He, he was bribing senators, he, he was bribing sen senators as much as couple thousand dollars each to support uh, the bill. We know that because uh, uh, that was came out in the in congressional investigation. There's a four or five hundred page uh, congressional investigation of this situation. Um, at one time, uh, Pierce sent an, his new Indian agent out to meet with the chiefs and to read the treaty to the chiefs. Say, do you really want, is this what you wanted? Is this what you plan to sign? And they said, no way. Well, uh, Thompson happened to be there with his henchmen and, uh, and uh, was intimidating the chiefs at, on the sidelines while uh, they were trying to explain the treaty to the chiefs. Anyway, uh, for four years, Pierce held off uh, Thompson. 
Pierce's uh, Indian agent, by the way, a man named Manny Penny, was actually a very honest man, uh, very unusual for a, a commissioner of Indian Affairs to be an honest man who really was trying to help the Indians. For example, when they negotiated the treaties in Kansas to buy the land from the uh, Indians in Kansas in order to open up for settlement, they reserved 28% of the land in Kansas for the Indians. It's the only time up until that point, it was the only time in U.S. history that a territory was created and land was set aside for the Indians. Up until that time, they were just forced out completely. But no, Danny Penny felt the Indians needed to have an opportunity to stay in the lands that they were you know, used to. And so 28% of the land in Kansas was set aside for, for the Native Americans. Anyway, for four years, the Pierce administration held off uh, Richard W. Thompson. On the day that James Buchanan was inaugurated, March 4, 1857, Thompson was paid $75,000 but from the Treasury. Pierce didn't understand how could this happen. Buchanan was a Democrat. Why would he suddenly uh, pay Thompson this money that was so clearly uh, corrupt? Turns out <coughs> that Buchanan, who was notoriously corrupt anyway, um, had made a deal with Thompson. Thompson was a leading Whig in Indiana. And what the, uh, the senator, uh, I can't think of his name now, the senator from Indiana who was uh, Buchanan's campaign manager, made a deal with Thompson that Thompson sat out the campaign in Indiana, didn't, didn't work against Buchanan, they would pay him his money uh, if, if Buchanan won the election. And Buchanan barely won Indiana, and Indiana was one of the states that uh, supported him, got him elected, and on the day that he was inaugurated, Thompson got his money. But it shows the difference between Pierce, who wouldn't have done it for political advantage, and Buchanan, who would, would have done anything to get to be president. Thompson, by the way, years later, was chosen Secretary of the Navy uh, by uh, President Hayes, of all people, who supposedly had a reputation of being an honest man. But while Thompson was Secretary of the Navy under Hayes, he was also being paid $25,000 a year by France to serve, to help them in the building of the Panama Canal, which was, went directly against U.S. interests at the time. Uh, when that was revealed, Thompson had to resign. His biographer said he was probably the most ethically challenged man of the 19th century. <laughs> <laughs> um, Pierce had his own opposition from within the state. This is uh, our old friend John Parker Hale, who had been a good friend of Pierce's uh, in college. And Pierce had actually brought Hale into the Democratic Party and promoted him up through the ranks. But they split on the slavery issue. And by the time Pierce was president, Hale was very bitter towards Pierce. And he got himself elected. Uh, to the U.S. Senate after the Kansas-Nebraska bill uh, was uh, caused Pierce to lose support. And Hale spent the last couple of years uh, just blasting the, the Pierce administration from his uh, seat in the U.S. Senate. And this man is somewhat like Richard W. Thompson. This is uh, Edmund Burke, of all people, is the name, not the philosopher from England. Uh, Edmund Burke was a politician from Newport, New Hampshire who had supported Pierce up uh, until Pierce was elected and claimed that he had been the one who elected Pierce or got Pierce elected. He had been a congressman and commissioner of patents in Washington for a number of years. But Pierce didn't trust Burke, and when he took office as president, he refused to give Burke a position in this administration. So without getting a patronage job, which was what Burke lived for, uh, he went back to New Hampshire and caused all kinds of trouble for Pierce uh, throughout the next four years. Anyway, uh, the last few months of Pierce's administration, the main issue in the country was the violence that was occurring in Kansas. Uh, the settlers had moved in. There had been fighting between the pro-slavery and anti-slavery settlers. Uh, John Brown had killed a bunch of people. Uh, there were guerrilla bands of, of Southerners roaming the territory. And uh, it was clear that Pierce had to do something. So he sent in the army. Uh, Jefferson Davis uh, did the best he could to have the army intercede between the two sides. And Pierce chose a new governor for Kansas, this man, John W. Geary of Pennsylvania. And Geary, this was later when he was a Civil War general, and uh, Geary went into Kansas and saw and got both sides to disarm. The army did their part to uh, stay between the two sides. And in the last few months of the Pierce administration, Kansas was peaceful. And as a result of that, Pierce is, uh, the, was able to elect the Democratic candidate for president, James Buchanan. The uh, Democrats rejected Pierce in his attempts to be nominated for a second term. 
this uh, cartoon, which is a, an anti-democratic cartoon, shows Pierce in the middle on the bottom uh, and Buchanan lying across the top, sort of the foundation for the pro-slavery. It's a slave owner and a slave uh, being propped up by the Democratic Party. So again, an anti-Democrat uh, 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 campaign poster from 1856. Anyway, uh, I think I've covered all the reasons why Pierce was considered a bad president, but just to give you a couple of ideas as to what he did accomplish as president. Uh, we've mentioned several things already with the improvements of the Army and the Navy and, and trade. Pierce also had the, uh, negotiated the Gadsden Purchase with Mexico, which uh, gave us all the land from El Paso to San Diego, the southern parts of uh, New Mexico and Arizona, the last part of the original 48 states to be added to the Union. Uh, he also, as I, said, as I said, balanced the budget and paid down the debt. He passed the lowest tariff bill in the country up to that time. Uh, another important uh, position of Franklin Pierce was standing up for the idea of religious tolerance and for open immigration. It's uh, one of the things that's unremembered today, or not remembered today, the Know Nothing movement. While Pierce was president, there was a very strong anti-Catholic, anti-immigrant movement that occurred in the country. I call it very similar to the Tea Party movement today. It just sort of sprang up uh, from nowhere and was the dominant issue for a couple of years. People didn't know what was going to be the big issue of the time. Was it going to be anti-slavery or was it going to be anti-Catholic, anti-immigrant? Pierce uh, stood up to this movement very strongly. He, he said, that first of all, he appointed the first Irish Catholic uh, ever to the U.S. cabinet, uh, his uh, postmaster general, James Campbell of uh, uh, Pennsylvania. Um, first Irish Catholic ever to serve in the, US, in the cabinet position. He also um, appointed the first Jew to a, a diplomatic post. August Belmont was made our ambassador to Switzerland. August Belmont, if you know Belmont Park, if you're a race car, racing fan, mm -hmm. August Belmont was one of the richest men in the country, and uh, Pierce appointed him to a diplomatic post. Pierce also spoke out in New York City uh, on a trip to there for the opening of the World's Fair. He made a famous speech in which he said that as far as he was concerned, the minute an immigrant stepped off the boat, he was an American. Just the idea that you came here and got here at that time meant that you were deserving of being treated as an American. So he stood up very strongly against the anti-Catholic movement and very strongly in favor of open immigration, two issues that were really uh, caused a lot of uh, commotion at the time. He also stood up against something called filibusters. Now, you, when I say filibusters to you, you're thinking about the Senate's uh, ability to uh, avoid voting on a bill. But a filibuster in the 19th century was entirely different. In the 19th century, a filibuster was an illegal military operation uh, to invade a foreign country. What a filibuster was, was a group of uh, uh, people who armed themselves, sailed off to Mexico or Cuba or uh, Nicaragua or Panama, and invaded the country and tried to take it over and then hand it to the United States. These were paramilitary uh, operations that were uh, going on all the time at that period of time. They were illegal, they were, they, but Pierce, Pierce opposed them. He sent the Navy out to try to uh, intervene and to prevent these people from sailing away from our shores. They were leaving from San Francisco, they were leaving from New Orleans, they were leaving from New York City. Uh, it was a constant problem. Uh, Pierce arrested the governor of uh, Mississippi at one point for, le for leading a, 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 a filibuster to uh, Mexico. Um, he did everything he could. He brought the people to, to, tr to trial. Uh, but the American people were so in favor of filibustering that not one person was ever convicted during the Pierce administration. There were times when uh, you know, our U.S. Marshals would be uh, seizing a boat and crowds of citizens would uh, arrive at the port uh, in New York, for example, or New Orleans, and who would hiss at the U.S. government for trying to stop the invaders from, from leaving our shores. And they would curse Pierce and so forth for not, for not allowing these filibusters to go forward. Remember, this is the idea of Manifest Destiny, where America was viewed as not just moving from east coast to west coast, but taking over all of the western hemisphere. <coughs> That's what Manifest Destiny meant. It didn't mean just moving from uh, east to west. It meant the United States was destined to take all of what the western hemisphere. But Pierce refused. He felt it was uh, immoral, it was illegal, and it was hurting our uh, position with foreign countries who thought that the United States was supporting these filibusters, uh, even though they were illegal. 
Pierce also improved relations with Great Britain, despite a lot of provocation. Uh, the British were taking land in Central America, despite treaties that indicated that the United States and Great Britain should both uh, stay neutral in Central America. Uh, they were uh, interfering with our neutral shipping rights during the Crimean War. They were interfering with our ships. And they were also trying to recruit soldiers for the Crimean War in the United States, which was very much illegal. The U.S. ambassador, or the British ambassador to the United States, uh, John Crampton, was, was leading this with his consuls in various cities. They were setting up recruiting offices and recruiting uh, people, then shipping them off to Canada to be shipped off uh, to join the British military. This was illegal. The Pierce administration stood up to the British. We fired Crampton and three consuls, gave them their, their passports, and sent them to Europe, sent them home, which you, you just don't do. It's a bit like breaking off diplomatic relations with a country. Uh, the fear was that the British would do the same to our ambassador, uh, and that that would probably lead to a possible <coughs> war uh, between the United States and Great Britain. But the British backed down. Uh, and in fact, uh, Benjamin Disraeli made a very famous speech in Parliament in which he said it would be wise if Britain would at last recognize that the United States, like the great countries of Europe, have a policy and that they have a right to have a policy. This was considered a very seminal uh, event in British-American relations, where the British finally recognized or began to recognize the United States as an equal country with the right to uh, have its own uh, policies. So in conclusion, and I'm sorry to have gone on for so long, uh, Pierce did not prevent the Civil War, and that's, of course, why he's, he's viewed so badly today by history. I've had a hard time trying to figure out what he could have done or what any president could have done at that time that would have made a difference. But nevertheless, it did occur, and the Kansas-Nebraska Act certainly helped bring it about. But while he was president, he supported open immigration and religious tolerance at a time when they were most imperiled. He believed in fair treatment for Native Americans, certainly a very unusual thing for a president in the 19th century. He fought against corruption in government. He prosecuted violators of the law. He improved our relations with Great Britain. He balanced the budget and paid down the debt. He maintained peace with all foreign nations despite provocations uh, uh, that could have brought us to war. Uh, he modernized the army and the navy. He opened up new lands for settlement, and he expanded the size of the United States. To me, that's not a bad record, considering the times, considering the lack of respect for law that, that was rampant in the country at that time, considering the corruption that was endemic to government at the time, considering the lack of support he had from within his own party, and considering the sectional turmoil that existed in the country uh, over the slavery issue. So I conclude that the United States could have done much worse than having Franklin Pierce as its president, and I would suggest that we probably have done much worse than other times. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, that's my talk, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Yes? Would you, I believe Pierce died in 1867, is that right? 69. 69. Would you comment on his position during the Civil War? Pierce believed that the war was avoidable and was a mistake. He never supported the need for the war. What he did... What most upset him was this, the belief that he had that the difference between the Democrats and the Republicans was that the Republicans were determined to expand the power of the national government, expand the power of the presidency, and to restrict individual liberty. That was his belief. And the, what upset him during the Civil War was the fact that individual liberty was restricted. Uh, Abraham Lincoln... <coughs> passed martial law throughout the country. 39,000 northern civilians were jailed and held without charges during the Civil War because of what they said or what they wrote about the Civil War. Uh, Pierce spoke out very strongly against those things. He, he thought it was a terrible, uh, needless waste, was his view. Now, what he would have done differently, he, he, would have, he, he spoke in favor of negotiating and letting the South go and hoping that we'd win them back and so forth and so on, which, you know, I think none of us think was a logical or, or a realistic uh, prospect. But nevertheless, that was his position. He was never in favor of the Civil War. He thought it was a mistake. He, the, the, uh, he was horrified by the bloodshed, uh, and he thought that a lot of it, he, he really believed that it was a Republican plot to uh, control the country, to, to uh, take over the politics of the nation.
And of course, he lost a lot of support from that too. Part of his <coughs> reputation today is the sense that he had, the people had that he was a traitor back then. You had a question in the back? Or? Yeah, I, I thought I visited his house, but I can't remember what little town it was in. Hillsboro. That's, that's, that's the yeah, uh, that's okay. the house that he grew up in, his father's house. Yeah. Uh, he lived there himself uh, until 1838. Um, it was very nice to tour. Yeah, they have a, they do a great job over there. Uh, yeah. Jim Marvin is the uh, man in charge. They have a real uh, active group of volunteers. It's actually a state-owned property, but the house itself is run by the Hillsborough Historical Society. They have a lovely um, carriage house with all yes. kinds, even the tourist. It was yep. amazing. It, I had yeah, never it's, seen uh, it. it's definitely worth the trip if you're it is. Uh, looking nice. for something to do on a Sunday afternoon in the, in the summer. Thank you. I couldn't remember the yeah. <laughs> Yes. He's generally rated in the bottom five or six. You think that is unfair? Well, you know, the problem I have I have a problem with these ratings. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. Uh, just the idea.